Just recent surveys are showing that the quilt industry by 2026 is going to be a $5 billion industry alone. Quilting came to me later in life, although growing up, I had watched my uh, grandmother quilt and I had inherited eight of her quilts, but I did not quilt as a child or as a young adult. Um, I was very much focused on being a professional woman and I went to Vanderbilt Law School. And after I graduated from Vanderbilt and moved to Atlanta, uh, my career ended up being in local government. So fast forward to being appointed the Fulton County Attorney, suffice it to say it was a very, very stressful job. I bought a book called Teach Yourself to Quilt and found that it was my passion. Just absolutely loved it. Never saw it coming. My uh paternal grandparents, but particularly my paternal grandmother was a quilter, uh, one out of necessity. And as generations changed, it became more of a, uh, more of a craft for her. Um, surprisingly, she did not teach me how to quilt. It was something that I learned how to do inherently. It was self-taught. When lawyers would come for a meeting and we were disagreeing about this or that, I would sit them in the conference room where there was a quilt I'd purposely be late for the meeting. And then I would come in and they would always be standing up looking at the quilt. And the first words out of their mouth, 99% of the time was, my grandmother made quilts. And what I learned from that is deep, deep in our subconscious, quilts make us think about our grandmothers. And those are happy, comforting, and loving thoughts. Yesterday, I pulled out a couple of quilts that my paternal grandmother made probably 100 years ago. And they still exist, and they mean something to me. And I started looking at the fabrics to see what time period they came from, You know, what was, what was happening in her life when she made that. Well, I used to see my grandmother and her friends sitting around the frame in the country, quilting. And I didn't think that much about it, but it was more the fellowship of the women when they all got together that intrigued me as a child. In the community that I was exposed to, there were not a lot of fabrics and things around, you know, and plus the, peop the black people did not have money to go out and buy the fabric. And so they started making use of what they had. And, you know, they used to buy feed for the chickens and whatever else. They would take the fabric, the bags from the uh, chicken feed and whatever and use that as fabric. And they would take your old clothes and cut those up and, you know, put it in. A, so you might see a quilt with stuff you've been seeing laying around the house uh, for the last five years in your quilt. We do what we have to do to make something work. My grandmother was a quilter, and she's from Birmingham, Alabama, and she always talked about the quilt quilting bee that she was active in when she lived in uh, Birmingham. And several of my 
relatives also were in the same quilting bee. So I kind of grew up with sewing always being done in the house. And of course, during the era that I grew up, it was required that girls took home ec, so you learned how to sew in junior high school also. So that's kind of how I got into quilting and using the scraps of whatever clothing she made. She would make the quilts out of it, you know, just piecing utilitarian type quilts, not the art quilts like we do today. And look, camera's rolling. Look, Katie, it was straight to the camera. Perfect. The camera. Mm -hmm. Well, quilting has many different significances for, for a community. Um, I think quilts are very powerful objects because of how they reflect uh, the lives of the maker, um, the lives often of their family, and even their larger community, because there are many cases where quilts aren't made by an individual, but are made collaboratively but they also um, really reflect the kind of aesthetic decisions of their makers. And this is especially true when you look at 20th century African-American quilts um, made by many different individuals in many different communities. But there's often a kind of uh, unifying factor of just artistic independence and brilliance that comes through in these quilts and speaks to the fact that they're more than just utilitarian objects. They were also objects of beauty. It's taken me a while to really embrace the whole quilter, quilt artist um, moniker. Um, when I do things that are really art related, where there's a focus on my quilting, I'm always surprised that people see me as that artist. I guess because I've spent, so much of it has been a, a secondary part of my life in terms of the public knowing what I do outside of my professional life. And so as I embrace the quilting aspect of my life now, you know, it surprises me that people see me as an artist and refer to me that way, you know, because they don't know me any other way. My friends and I, um, I guess I would say, did not feel as connected with traditional quilting. And so we branched out into what we would call art quilts, and more importantly, quilts that were colorful and um, I guess we made quilts like the way we dress, you know, just that intercultural thing with that African heritage and whoever you are, it's what comes out in your quilting. Hopefully the quilting is inspiring a younger generation um, as an art form. You know, it's not just utilitarian. They can tell their stories and it's looked as a piece of work that's timeless so that the next generation after them can look upon it and know what was going on in the world uh, or in that particular community. There are so many contemporary artists, especially um, you know, those who are in either mid-career or, or emerging, who are working in textile-based practices that seem to um, really pay homage to the, the influence that quilters in their life had on them. You know, quilters, I feel like, are finally getting their shine. Like artists such as Lisa Butler, Adana, you know, all these different creatives from quilting have inspired artists like myself to push the envelope and create something new. Uh, my love for quilting came from my mom. Uh, she was a quilter and a sewer, and I would help her on projects as well as we would take uh, weekend sewing classes and quilting classes as well as like visiting small um, quilt shops collecting fabric like since I was six or seven years old. I did not know that I wanted quilting and fi fiber arts and textiles to be my medium until I would say like 2015, 2016. I think subconsciously I may have known, known since I was like middle school, um, whenever we were able to do an art project in our own style, I would always go towards that medium of using fabrics and quilting and sewing. Um, so subconsciously I've known since I was a young child, but I really started to focus on that in my art practice. 
um, just around like 2015, 2016. The Atlanta Quilt Festival was the result of a annual event hosted by O.V. Brantley, Overtis Brantley, one of my co-founders, my partner and co-founder of the Atlanta Quilt Festival. We had something called Fabric is Better Than Food. It was a brunch that she hosted every year at her house, and it would be a group of about 15, 20 of us. We'd get together. We'd share our quilts. We'd create a quilt challenge for the next year so that we'd come back and uh, to meet that challenge and make something and then we'd share it with each other. We'd fellowship with food. And from that, we decided we need to show these works of art. You know, we need to have a venue to do that. So we had, we created a space for ourselves. And so we hooked up with Myrna uh, from over at Hammond's house, and her, uh, she was able to get the South Fulton uh, Art Center down um, in the south part of the county. And here we are, working on year 15. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I know, I know. They put on a show. They put on a show, Mike. I ain't never sat and watched it on TV at 5 o'clock a.m. I think we, everybody in this room wants that show to be a big success and we tell a lot of people about it and every year, I guess I've been involved with it for close to 10 years and every year it's bigger and better and the quality of the quilts has really gone up. And I mean, she's, OV's starting to get quilts from all over the country now. Of course, she is the queen of social media. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> quilts are not well represented in American museum collections because nobody takes responsibility for them. Um, you know, they're not in painting and sculpture departments, which are the kind of typically most well-resourced departments uh, at any museum. And they're, they are sometimes in decorative arts and design departments, as they were historically here at the High. Um, but they just weren't very well represented, especially quilts made by African American women, you know, because of issues of longstanding institutional racism and, um, you know, undermining the kind of cultural production of Black people in the United States. Um, undermining the cultural production of women in the United States. So for all of these reasons, quilts have just not been well represented. To me, creating our own space to show our work is empowering. We're not relying on the community at, you know, at large, the larger community to give us anything. You know, we're providing that space for ourselves and we're making the noise that's, you know, bringing attention to the work that we do. I went over to my daughter's uh, church. They have uh, a chicken. They have lots of chickens, mm -hmm. and they have a huge garden. So I took pictures of the chickens because in John Lewis's book and in real life, he talked about when he was about six or seven years old, mm -hmm. he became responsible for the chickens. Right. And so he started preaching to the chickens. They were his congregants. And <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I thought, okay, how can I incorporate this into my quilt? I thought that was kind of... A neat thing, Reverend King, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr., he called him the boy from Troy. So my plan is to, on the back of the jacket of the little boy, I'm putting the boy from Troy. I like that. How long would this take? Well, I was going to try to have this part sewn before you got here today, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then what I'm going to do is applique mm -hmm. the chickens onto this background. This is actually the grass from here but I'll also top stitch it with a brighter green thread just to give it some kind of depth and texture. John Lewis, um, his, his affection for quilts, as you mentioned, was important to him because um, he, told, he relayed a story about when he was a young child on the farm in Alabama. The, one of the times that the family gathered, gathered together was around the quilt frame. And he as a child would sit, you know, with the women of the family around the quilt frame and they would quilt. And he described the quilt frame, how it hung from the ceiling and they could bring it down and, and work on 
uh, one project collectively that was going to be utilized by somebody in the family. And that was a good, warm memory for him. I remember as he told the story, he literally choked up. And so I think that's why quilts were important to him. And he knew that most quilts, particularly made by African-Americans, had a history and it had a story to it. And I'm sure that quilt that he was draped in probably has a story behind it. The quilting is so important because, as you know, Congressman Lewis was a lover of the arts. As, as a part of that, he had quilts that were uh, given to him as gifts, and in his final days, those quilts surrounded him with love. He and Lillian were art enthusiasts. If you are able to go to his home, you will see quilts uh, all over uh, his home. He loved art and he, he loved the art of quilt making. You understand that in the era in which he grew up, uh, those were just blankets. <laughs> but later on, they became uh, objects of art and he really, really loved that. And he loved the fact that African-American hands had put those together. Um, I like for my quilts to have a message. Um, I either name my quilt something that I think should encourage you to, to live a happy and well-balanced life. And I think that comes from the lawyer. And you know, lawyers like to give advice. Lawyers think they know everything. <laughs> a message? Uh, beauty. Just see the world with color and texture, you know, that's all.